Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about bond pricing. In other words, how do the prices of bonds get determined in the bond market? And when I say bond market, I mean a market in which bonds are getting bought and sold. Now, before I get deep into bond pricing, I want you to appreciate something that is a central principle or a central tenant of finance. And that is this, the worth of any asset, including bonds, so stocks as well, at any given point in time depends on two main things. One, it's expected cash flows. And second, the investor's required rate of return, which we also call the investor's discount rate. So this is very, very important. So if you go back to your chapter on present value or time value of money or discounted cash flow valuation, you know, whatever you may have called it, you may recall that you saw something like this where you said, look, the present value or what we're referring to as value here. So present value of an income stream or a cash flow stream is just you taking the expected cash flows. So E stands for expected CF cash flow. You take the cash flows at time period one, two, all the way to some time period, say T. This could be 10, 15, 20. Sometimes it can be infinite. And then you discount them at your required rate of return. And so this is referred to as the discount rate. And what is important for you to realize is that the discount rate in turn depends on how risky the cash flows are. All else equal, the more risky the cash flows, the higher is the discount rate because for taking on more risk, you typically require a higher rate of return and therefore your discount rate is higher as well. So now with that background, understand that for a bond, pricing or valuation of a bond works exactly the same way. The nice thing about bonds is that its expected cash flows are purely determined by its face value, its coupon rate, and its time to maturity. If you know these three things, then you can figure out what are the cash flows that I can expect to get from a bond. So for example, if I gave you a bond which has a face value of like $1,000, let's suppose that it has a coupon rate of 8% and time to maturity is 10 years. In other words, it's going to mature in 10 years. Assuming that this bond makes annual coupon payments, this means that the timeline looks something like this, where here you are at time period zero. This is today. Over the next 10 years, you are going to get payments of 80. And then at the end of the 10th year, you're going to get the face value of the bond, which is a thousand dollars. Now, let's suppose that I told you that somehow you knew that investors require a rate of return of 8% from holding this bond as well. Suppose you knew that. Then essentially, if I take you back in this particular equation, you know the expected cash flows from the face value, the coupon rate, the time to maturity. And I'm also telling you the rate of return that investors require. In other words, I'm telling you the discount rate. So with all that information, can you determine the price? Absolutely, you can. Because all you got to do is just plug in these numbers into this equation. Specifically, if this is the valuation equation, you say value is 80 divided by 1 plus 0 0.08. Why? Because 80 is the first cash flow. As you can see, it's right here, the first cash flow. And the rate at which you're discounting this is the investor's required rate of return, which is 8%. And then you discount the second, so on and so forth. The last cash flow is 1,080. And so that will get discounted back 10 years. Now, you might be asking, why call it value? Why not price? Actually, price and value are the same thing. This is a subtle but an important point. If all investors value the bond for some reason at, uh, let's suppose, $800. I haven't determined the price of this particular bond yet. But let's suppose that there was a bond which is worth $800 to everybody. And for some reason in the market, it is selling for $700. That is the price. So there is value here, but then the price is here. 
and the value is different from price. Well, guess what's going to happen? If there is an active market in which bonds are selling and people are buying them, everybody's going to realize that, oh, there's something worth $800 that is selling for $700. What do you think is going to happen? Everybody's going to rush to buy it because it's cheap. And that extra demand is eventually going to drive the price of the bond up to how much? To eventually $800. So that is why, even though this equation is about valuation, we don't differentiate between price and value because, again, the assumption is that there is a well-functioning market in which the prices reflect the value of the asset in question. Now, coming back to this example, so while this equation is technically correct, what we typically end up doing is break up the stream of cash flows into two different components. If you take a closer look, if this thousand weren't there, what you're looking at is a stream of $80, and this looks very much like an annuity. So if somebody asked you, what is the present value of just this stream of $80, not this 1000 just this 80 you'd say, ah, that looks like an annuity. And you know from your previous classes that present value of an annuity is given using this formula, where the C represents the amount of the annuity, which in this case would be $80. And then if this stream of 80s weren't there, but you only had this $1,000 that you were expecting to get 10 years from now, that would be like you getting a single cash flow 10 years from now. And if somebody asked you, what is the present value of that at time period zero? You'd be like, huh, that's just a single cash flow. So future value, future value of, uh, in this case, $1,000, which is 10 years out. So T stands for 10 years out. I'll just need to discount that back at my required rate of return. You know, 10 years back. And so you can think of the price of a bond then as the sum of the two, right? Because you can discount the annuity separately and you can discount the thousand or one single lump sum future cash flow separately and add the two up. And so bond pricing or bond value is typically then written in this form as well, where if you know what is the annuity that you're getting, you can calculate the present value of the annuity separately. In this case, your required rate of return is R, which is 8%. 8 Time is T, which is 10 years, because the annuity is for 10 years. And finally, you can add the discounted value of just the $1,000 discounted 10 years back. Add the two up, you get the valuation or the price of a bond. Now, if you actually went ahead and solved this equation, what you will find is that the value of the bond will come out to exactly $1,000. This is not a coincidence. This 1,000 is coming out to be exactly equal to the face value of the bond. This doesn't happen always, but it is happening in this case. Why? Because your required rate of return is exactly equal to the coupon rate. I'll explain this in just a minute. But first, think about this intuitively. If somebody comes to you today and says, look, here's a piece of paper. I call it a bond. If you hold this bond, I'm going to give you $80, which is 8% of the thousand. And mind you, 8% here is the what we call the coupon rate. So I'm going to give you 8% for the next 10 years, and then I'm going to give you $1,000 back. How much are you willing to pay me today? And so if the coupon rate is 8%, which is what the borrower is offering to you, and the rate of return that you require is also 8%, then you'd say, yeah, take my 1,000. Why? Because if I give you 1,000, you give me 8%, which is my required return, for the next 10 years, I make that 8% and then I get a $1,000 back. Yeah, that's how I get my 8%. And so remember, the moral of the story here is that whenever the coupon rate is equal to the rate of return that investors require, price of the bond is going to be exactly equal to its face value. Now, let's suppose for some reason things change, specifically Let's suppose that for some reason, investors now require a rate of return of 10% here, okay? 
So now, if the corporation comes to you and says, look, I'm offering a coupon rate of 8%, I'm going to give you 8% of 1,000 and then give you $1,000 back, and you say, eh, I actually want a rate of return of 10%. In other words, I want 10% of 1,000, technically. So the only reason why I'd be willing to give you $1,000 today is if you give me 10% of 1,000, and then give me my thousand dollars back. The borrower says, no, you know, I'm only going to give you 8% of a thousand because that's the coupon rate. That's what the coupon rate is set at. Then how do you make your 10%? Well, the only way you can make your 10% is if you give the borrower something less than a thousand dollars, right? Because if you give something less than a thousand dollars and at the end get a thousand dollars back, then that difference in the price that you paid helps you make up for the fact that, you, that you're only getting 8% of 1,000 in the form of coupon payments. And so qualitatively or intuitively, the price of the bond should be lower than 1,000. And you can actually find that out, of course. You, all that you need to do is in this formula, you don't change the coupon payments, you don't change the time to maturity, which is 10 years, but you do change the rate of return that investors now require, which is 10%. And if you will do this math, you will find out that the worth of the bond will come out to $877.11. The key point here is that this is less than $1,000, which is the face value of the bond. And so remember, remember, the moral of the story here is that whenever the rate of return that investors require is more than the coupon rate, price of the bond is going to be lower than the face value. And the exact opposite holds for situations when the rate of return that investors require is less than the coupon rate. So let's suppose that the borrower is offering something like uh, 8%, but you require only 6%. All you wanted was $60 in coupon payments, and you would have given $1,000 here and then received $1,000 back. You're getting 80. People are going to rush towards this bond. They're going to want to buy more of it. And intuitively, therefore, eventually, the price of the bond is going to be something higher than $1,000. In fact, if you do the math, you will find out that this will come out to 1147.20, which as you can see is greater than 1,000, which is the face value. And all I had to do in this formula was to replace the required rate of return with 6%. Everything else remains the same. And so the moral of the story here, whenever the rate of return required is less than the coupon rate, the price of the bond is going to be greater than the face value of the bond. And so what you observe then is a negative, a negative relationship between the price of a bond and what is called its yield to maturity. So that's the other thing. In the context of bond valuation, yield to maturity is nothing but the rate of return that investors are requiring from investing in a bond. Basically, they're saying that, look, if we buy the bond and hold it till maturity, what is the yield that we can expect to get till maturity, which is basically what they want, which is 6% or 10% or 8%, depending on what their required rate of return is. And so don't get confused by this term. And notice that when the yield to maturity is 8%, which is when it is exactly equal to the coupon rate, the price of the bond is exactly equal to 1,000, which is face value. When it goes lower, prices go up, 1147.20 in our case. When it was the yield to maturity went up, the price falls. So there is a negative relationship between bond prices and yield to maturity. And now if you go and read your Wall Street journals or New York Times, you will often see them saying this, yields which rise when bond prices fall. How far can bonds fall as interest rates rise again? And here again, as a result of rising rates, prices of practically all bonds have fallen this year. 
My point is that all of these clips are essentially emphasizing the same idea. As yields go up, in other words, as investors required rate of return goes up from holding a bond, their prices fall. It's really that simple. Now, a very good question to ask is, why would yields go up? What are the factors that cause investors required rate of return or the yields to maturity to go up? and as a result cause bond prices to fall or vice versa? That's a great question. We'll tackle that in a separate video. The main objective of this video was to show you A, how bond prices are determined, and B, show you that bond prices and yield to maturity of a bond are inversely related.